On the night of November 24, 2001, a Crossair RJ100 carrying 33 people began its descent towards Zurich International Airport in Switzerland. It had left Berlin Tegel Airport in Germany just under an hour ago. Most of the passengers were German, but there were eight other nationalities on board, including a number of Israeli, Swiss and US citizens, among others. At the helm of the flight was Captain Hans Ulrich Lutz. At 57 years old, he was a highly experienced pilot, with almost 20,000 hours of flying under his belt. As we will see shortly, however, the quantity of hours does not matter nearly as much as their quality. The first officer, Stefan Lohr, on the other hand, was highly inexperienced. He was aged 25 and had just been hired by Crossair. At the time of this flight, Lohr had less than 500 hours of total flying experience, 40 times less than the captain. This is a story of two parts. The first concerns the roughly 30 minutes leading up to the accident. The second, even more shocking than the first, spans the 40 years leading up to the night of the crash and uncovers a stunning history of incompetence and negligence. I will detail all of this in a few minutes, but first, let's go back to the night of the accident. The aircraft the pilots were flying on this night was a six-year-old British-made Avro 146 or J100. This jet was designed as a reliable short to medium haul aircraft and was relatively popular in the US, Europe and Australia during the 1990s and early 2000s. The crew began their approach preparations during the cruise at 27,000 feet over southern Germany. At just after half past nine in the evening local time, the pilots received the runway report from Zurich, describing the conditions of the runways at the airport. The first officer began interpreting this report, after which the captain launched into an unnecessary two-minute lecture on how to interpret runway reports. At 20 to 10, the crew received their initial descent clearance from air traffic control. The captain briefed the first officer about the approach he was expecting them to fly. As the captain carried out his briefing, the first officer noticed that the aircraft speed was getting high. So high, in fact, that it was, quote, going somewhat into the red. Captain Lutz responded to this by saying, yes, 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 it ran away, sorry, have to bring it back a bit. He reduced thrust to the engines and continued his approach briefing. He briefed an arrival into runway 14 at Zurich, which had a full instrument landing system, and so it would be relatively straightforward. At 12 minutes to 10, air traffic control told the pilots that the runway they would be landing on was not runway 14, as they had been anticipating, but instead the westerly facing runway 28. Upon hearing this from air traffic control, the captain hissed, Oh shiz at that too? Okay. This is when things started to go wrong for the crew. The reason for this change was that approaches to runway 14 overfly a number of villages in southern Germany, and residents had not been happy about the noise of incoming aircraft. So, just one month before this flight, Authorities in Germany and Switzerland had agreed that between 10pm and 6am, flights arriving into Zurich would land on runway 28 instead. Here's why this is important. Before this change had been agreed upon, runway 28 was rarely used, as the winds were generally not favourable for landing in a westerly direction at Zurich. As such, there hadn't been as much funding put into the navigation technologies used on the approach for runway 28. This meant that approaches to the runway used a more old-fashioned and complicated system, known as the VOR DME approach. This would increase the pilot's workload as they neared the airport. The pilots entered a holding pattern above Zurich, and during this time they went over the approach to runway 28. The two pilots were tired and frustrated. This was their last flight of a long day, and now they had to make a more difficult approach than the one they had originally planned. Captain Lutz described the approach procedure to the first officer, who would be flying the aircraft. The approach involved the pilots using their instruments to closely monitor their distance from a radio beacon, and ensuring that they are at particular altitudes at particular distances from the airport. For the final segment of the approach, when they were 11 kilometers from the beacon, they would need to descend to their minimum descent altitude, or MDA, which was 2,400 feet, and stay at this height until they saw the runway. This would be difficult, as the cloud ceiling on that night was low, and visibility was just 3,500 meters, with sleet and snow on the final approach. At 9.53 p.m., the pilots began their descent to fly this approach into Zurich. Ten minutes later, they were making their final turn to line up with the runway, and approach control had just handed them over to Zurich Tower. As they made this right-hand turn, the captain mentioned to the first officer that he could see the ground, as he was able to see the lights of a village below through the clouds. This was good news, as it bode well for their chances of seeing the runway soon. The pilots were eager to get on the ground. The last thing they wanted was to go around because they couldn't see the runway. A few miles ahead, another crosshair plane had just touched down. The pilots of this plane informed the tower that the visibility on final approach was low, and that they only saw the runway two miles before touchdown. This was overheard by the pilots of Crossair 3597, who were now 8 miles away and anxious about whether they'd see the runway in time. There were two strict rules the pilots had to follow during this approach. The first was that they were only allowed to descend below the minimum descent altitude once they had sight of the runway. The second was that they would have to make a decision about whether to land or not at 300 feet above the ground. If they didn't see the runway at this point, they would have to go around. 
When the crew were six miles from the runway, they contacted Zurich Tower and informed them that they were established on the final approach. The plan, as per the approach procedures, was to descend to the minimum descent altitude of 2,400 feet and to stay at that altitude until they saw the runway, after which they could start descending. The pilots should have lowered the landing gear and flaps earlier, before beginning their final approach, but they only did this once they were already descending to the minimum descent altitude. The landing gear and flaps create a lot of drag, and this slowed the plane down. The right thing to do as a response to this would have been to make the descent more shallow as well, as the plane was now descending the same amount over a shorter distance. The captain didn't do this, however. Because of this, the aircraft started to descend below the glide path. At 5 past 10, the captain remarked that they were nearing the minimum descent altitude. At this point, he was very eager to see the runway. Remembering the flight which had landed in front of them, the captain said, Someone said he saw the runway late here, approaching minimum descent altitude. The captain knew that the other pilots in front of him had seen the runway around when they reached the minimum descent altitude, and he was expecting it to come into view very shortly. However, what he didn't account for was the fact that because he had slowed down so much, he ended up reaching this altitude a lot further from the runway than expected. He was still about 4 miles away from the runway when he reached the MDA, and yet he assumed he was about 2 miles away. Eager to press on with the approach, the captain said, 2-4, the minimum, I have ground contact, we're continuing at the moment. It appears we have ground contact, we're continuing on. At the same time, the co-pilot said quietly to himself, 2-4. When the captain mentioned ground contact, he was referring to the hills and village lights directly below the aircraft. This is not enough to descend below the MDA. For that, you need to have the runway lights in sight. Despite neither pilot seeing the runway, they continued their descent below the MDA. This was a critical mistake, and the first officer, perhaps intimidated by the captain's experience, didn't object to it. Neither pilot realised that they were still four miles from the runway instead of two. They incorrectly expected the runway to come into view at any moment. There is an instrument on board which the pilots are supposed to be monitoring, called the DME, or Distance Measuring Equipment. This shows them how far they are from the navigation beacon they have tuned their radios to. If they had checked this instrument even once, they would immediately have realised that they were in fact four miles from the runway, and that they are well below where they should have been at this point of the approach. The aircraft was at low altitude, far out from the airport, almost hugging the ground as the pilots searched for the runway through the fog. As it later turned out, this was not the first time the captain had commenced an approach like this. Six years earlier, in 1995, Captain Lutz was flying into Lugana Airport in Switzerland at night. There were clouds and he couldn't see the runway from where he was. He dived the aircraft at a descent rate of 4,000 feet per minute, levelling off just 300 feet above the lake. From there, he sped along just 300 feet above the water at well above the correct approach speed until the runway at the edge of the lake came into view and he landed. Incredibly, this incident only became known to Crossair after the accident in 2001, which we will now return to. As the aircraft descended below minimum descent altitude, the automated voice of the radio altimeter announced that the aircraft was now 500 feet above the ground. Referencing the aircraft which had landed in front of him, Captain Lutz immediately responded, Shiza, two miles, he said, he sees the runway. A few seconds later, when the aircraft reached 300 feet above the ground, the automated voice called out, Minimums, meaning the pilots must decide whether to land or go around. The rules on this are crystal clear. If you don't see the runway when you're at minimums, you must go around. At this point, the air traffic controller cleared the plane to land, and as he gave this clearance, the captain suggested quietly to the first officer, who was flying the plane, Make a go around? Two seconds later, both pilots simultaneously said go round, and the first officer immediately disconnected the autopilot and pushed the thrust levers forwards. But it was too late. One second later, the aircraft began impacting the trees. The plane first hit the trees on the crown of a hill, which destroyed the engines and ripped through the wing, bursting the fuel tank and causing a plume of flames to start spewing back from the wing. The plane careened through the air for a few more seconds before plunging into a forest in the valley below and bursting into flames. In an unlikely stroke of good luck, the tail section of the aircraft remained mostly intact, and seven passengers and two flight attendants seated in that area managed to escape the burning wreckage. Four minutes after the crash, the controller noticed that the plane hadn't landed, and he alerted the emergency services. They arrived at the scene of the crash in a number of minutes, directed by locals who had seen the aircraft burning. The plane had been consumed by flames at that point, however, and all 24 remaining passengers and crew had died, including both pilots. This accident came as a shock to Switzerland, it was the second fatal crash involving a crosshair plane at Zurich in the last two years. In January of the previous year, a crosshair plane bound for Dresden in Germany crashed shortly after takeoff from Zurich in low visibility conditions, killing all 10 passengers and crew. In that case, investigators found that the pilots, who were from Eastern Europe, had not been properly trained for flying in the low visibility conditions common in Switzerland. Was the crash of Crosshair Flight 3597 another such case? The investigation into this crash quickly determined that the flight's final 30 minutes were only half the story, 
In fact, while trawling through the captain's records, investigators uncovered a shocking history spanning decades, which made them question whether the captain should ever have been allowed to fly. The captain's relationship with flying was shaky from the start. In 1961, at age 17, he failed his very first entry exam to begin flight training. He was then rejected three more times between 1963 and 1965 due to a lack of educational qualifications. After a rocky decade and a half of stumbling through training and gathering his licenses, Lutz finally applied to the position as first officer at Crossair in 1979. Previous instructors had described his difficulties understanding and using the navigation systems, and even following basic procedures and checklists. Despite this, he passed his exams at Crossair in 1979, with the grade below average to average. Lutz was now a professional pilot, carrying passengers around Europe. Over a decade later, in 1995, Crossair had acquired some MD-80 aircraft. These were some of the largest and most modern passenger aircraft in the Crossair fleet, and they represented an exciting opportunity for pilots in the airline to upgrade for mostly slower propeller aircraft. A number of pilots at the airline, including the captain, were chosen to train on this new fleet of aircraft. The conversion course began in January 1996, but straight away the captain had problems reaching the required performance levels. Two additional simulator sessions were offered to him, yet even after these sessions, he was unable to successfully complete the training. The airline decided that he should not continue with this conversion course, and that they would give him another chance to upgrade in a few months. This chance came around in June that same year. Yet again, the captain had major problems with the MD-80's digital flight guidance system. These issues continued throughout the course, and the captain ultimately failed the type rating exam at the end. Reports listed a number of difficulties, including with the manual control of the aircraft, an unsystematic approach to the use of the flight guidance system, and a limited ability to analyse and make decisions at the appropriate time. These were damning failures on the captain's part, and they warranted investigation by Crossair into whether he was even suitable to fly the aircraft he had been flying. Yet Crossair made no attempt to assess the captain's general suitability for flying, nor did they investigate the reasons he failed the conversion course. He went back to flying the Saab 340 until Crossair decommissioned it in the year 2001. At this point, the airline started him on a conversion course for the Avro RJ85 and 100, the aircraft he would end up crashing that same year. Incredibly, when the captain began the training course for this aircraft, the chief pilot at Crossair, who was supervising his conversion, reported having had no knowledge that the captain had previously failed to convert to the MD-80 on two occasions. The captain's conversion to the Avro RJ100 and 85 appears to have been more straightforward, however. It was a simpler aircraft than the MD-80, and no failures or significant training mistakes were noted in his record. He began flying passengers on this aircraft later that year. You might be wondering at this point what kind of pilot Lutz was from day to day, if his training and examinations went so poorly. As it turns out, his actual flying mirrored his training failures to a worrying degree. In his long career at Crossair, the captain caused a number of incidents, and on one occasion damaged an aircraft so much that it had to be scrapped. On February 21st, 1990, the captain was instructing a new pilot on the Saab 340. At one point, while on the ground, the captain had the co-pilot put the landing gear in the up position, in order to show him that this would not lead to the retraction of the landing gear. Unfortunately, it did. The gear collapsed and the plane fell to the ground, injuring Captain Lutz. The plane itself was written off. In one of the few times the Crossair sanctioned the captain, he was relieved from his position of flying instructor on the Saab 340 as a result of this accident. Another incredible incident happened on March 21st, 1999, when the captain, together with a co-pilot and flight attendant, made a private flight with 30 passengers on board a Saab 340. The plan was to take off from Zurich and go sightseeing around the Alps, and then to land in Sion Airport before returning to Zurich. On the way out to Sion, Lutz realised at one point that the normal time to have arrived at the airport had elapsed, and so he made an approach to the first runway he saw, believing it was Sion. Unbeknownst to him, this was actually another airport entirely, which is located about 50 kilometres to the south of Sion. Despite not hearing from Sion Air Traffic Control after calling them, the approach was continued right up until they were almost on the runway, when the passengers could see road signs that they were in fact in Italy, not Switzerland. The captain then initiated a go-round and flew over into another valley where he landed in Sion. This navigation error was explained to passengers, but the airline was never informed of the incident, and learned about it only after the crash of Crossair 3597. In light of these events, it was perhaps only a matter of time before one of the captain's reckless mistakes had fatal consequences. But he cannot be held solely responsible for the crash of this aircraft. The fact that Crossair continued to allow him to fly for decades, despite his training failures and various mishaps, means that they too contributed significantly to this final outcome. The federal government too was culpable for allowing this unsafe culture to fester at Crossair. The final report included almost 30 recommendations aimed at preventing similar accidents in future. These included everything from improvements in weather observation, to changes in flying procedures in low visibility, and the design of approach charts. 
Based on these recommendations, Swiss authorities fitted runway 28 at Zurich with an instrument landing system. They also added a minimum safe altitude warning system to the air traffic control software, which alerts controllers when pilots descend too low while on approach. Switzerland's Federal Office of Civil Aviation also doubled the number of inspectors. Previously, they had been so understaffed that nobody had ever audited Crossair to ensure that it was complying with regulations. Crossair merged with Swissair in 2002, which is now Swiss International Airlines. To this day, there has not been another air crash at Zurich Airport or of a plane belonging to Swiss International Airlines. If you found this video interesting, subscribe for more weekly air crash documentaries. Let me know in the comments if there are any accidents or incidents you'd like to see covered, and I'll do my best to feature them in future videos. Thanks again for watching.